Well, hello everybody. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report on Eye on Business. These are stories that I like to tell you and lessons I like to give. You'll find them in the books called Burkonomics, and those books are available on the Amazon bookstore and other places as well. Today, we're going to talk in the first of two series on building a great business and doing it, in this case, by building great boards. So a board of directors is going to be something that you may question whether or not you want or you need. So an enterprise risks, an entrepreneur's risk for establishing a board of directors for the first time, you ought to think about before you do this. These are the negatives if you want to think of them as negatives. The first is a board can hire and fire the CEO. Now if you still own the majority shares, that's inconsequential because you control the board. Number two is a board can influence and control strategy. Now, you may, as an entrepreneur, not, might, might not want the board to do just that. But in most cases, it's an aid and never a detriment. And a board can withhold approvals for funding. And it can withhold other approvals, too, depending on whether or not these uh, are powers given to the board, such as acquisitions and help in uh, supporting the management vision. But those things are things that are important for you to consider that might be the negatives but aren't necessarily. So instead, let's talk about the stages of a board. You may be an entrepreneur watching the show that has a very small company that thinks they would never need a board, any kind of board, directors, advisors, or anything of the kind. At the same time, as you may be somebody looking to grow, and one way to grow is to get great advice. So let's talk about the several stages of a board. If you're in the earliest stage, you probably don't need a board. You have no outside investors. You probably, if anything, would want an advisory board. But finally, at some point, you may be getting third-party investors. And by the way, that might be family members, or it could be people from the outside. But the third-party investors will often insist on some sort of at least information, if not control. And so there needs to be a balance in this case between management and this newly formed, first-time only, board of directors. And today we're going to talk about just that, including how that board of directors is supposed to behave. And then, of course, if you're in a later stage, and not many of you watching this will be, you'll have a venture round in your life, and early investors may leave the board, and that's something to discuss. And there is more care necessary, and we'll talk about what that kind of legal protection means. Three stages, early, I mean very early, early stage with third-party investors, and mid-stage. So those are the three stages. Next, let's talk about the duties of a board. So we're now talking about the positive things that a board can do for you. First, provide and monitor resources for company management. And a board can help you raise funds. It can help you use those funds, reduce costs. In future times, we're going to go into that in more depth. But it is something to know that a board can be very helpful in helping you do things you could not do or would not know to do for yourself. And in some cases, the board will help you as you hire, manage, or replace executives, including the CEO, maybe even including yourself. And a board has compensation duties so your compensation is approved by the board as part of an activity when there are outside investors. And finally, helping you to, sh to shape strategy and vision. So a board, in essence, ensures the health of the organization. That is the way in which, strategically, a board would behave. But now we're going to look at the board itself and how an effective board works. So effective boards provide strategic assets and a competitive advantage and an elevated purpose. They help you to think beyond the day-to-day, -day, and they help you to perform better. So they're good coaches as well as great assets in helping these things to happen. And they focus you on the right questions, which you may misunderstand is something that uh, many people down in the weeds don't think about. And they help you to partner with others as well, and they become partners with you just as well as that. And so they and you accept individual responsibility but group accountability. That's a pretty stiff set of words, but what it really means is it, the board works with you as if both of you are actionable and therefore responsible for the health of the company and the growth of the company as well. So there are some legal responsibilities of a board that we need to cover as we're speaking about a board of directors, perhaps for the first time if you've never seen this before. And those legal responsibilities include the duty of loyalty to the corporation, not to their own investors, and not to you as an individual, and the duty of care. And you'll see on the screen a couple of sub-duties that we'll not cover today, but the duty of care means care of the asset itself. With those two duties, 
it is important to know that a board has to be aligned with you on behalf of the shareholders, even if you are the only shareholder. There are two committees, an audit committee that makes sure that the legal responsibilities of taking care of the financials are taken care of, and second, there's a compensation committee. And you'll notice in a previous slide that the compensation committee covers not just your compensation, but usually the compensation of people reporting directly to you, and finally, all option grants to any employees if you happen to grant options as well. Well, that's all we have for today, and in future times, we're going to discuss much more about the boards so you know how to pay them and how they expect to be paid, and other kinds of boards like advisory boards as well. All this is in Birkonomics books, available again on Amazon and other sources, but I hope that you gather from this that boards can be helpful and that you may consider having one if you don't already. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report for Eye on Business. Hi, I'm Susan Howington, CEO of Power Connections Career Services, and you are watching Eye on Business. Good afternoon, this is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Eye on Business. And I want to welcome Susan Howington. Susan's the CEO and uh, founder of Power Connections, uh, an executive coaching and semi-recruiting firm, I'll put it that way. Um, before we get into the topic tonight, and that's going to talk about how do you build an effective team, especially executive leadership, Susan, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little about you? Sure. Thank you, first, David, for having me on your show. I'm honored, and I think it's great to be here. But I am the CEO of Power Connections Career Services. We are an executive coaching firm, but we are also what's called an outplacement firm. We work with companies when they're going to do some kind of downsizing of people. We also work with individuals that want to invest in a coach for their job transition process. Oh, wow. I'm, you know, with the outplacement stuff, it kind of threw me because I, I remember that, you know, having been outplaced before, but, you know, it's just the nature of being in the tech world, I guess. Absolutely it is. So let's talk about teams. Uh, this is something that's really important. And you know, a few days ago, I was with my colleagues at Tech Coast Angels, and we were talking about when to invest in a company. And we had like five or six criteria. The number one criteria by a significant amount was the team itself. Mm -hmm. So... In your experience, how do you build an executive team? How do you build a team? And maybe take some of the experiences you've either seen or even in your own personal world. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, building teams with entrepreneurial ventures and startups are really near and dear to my heart, heart because I think there are elements to it that are very different from developing a team in an established business or publicly held business. The, the main factors, David, I think are keeping in mind that you're building a structure for that organization. And using the analogy of structure, you're talking about the pillars of the business. Okay. And so in building the structure, you want to have various talents. Not only talents and skills, but you also want to have attitudes and personalities and you're looking at fit. So it's a really fun and interesting concept, but it is more than developing the product, as you probably know. Right. It's really about who do you have on the team and what does, e does each of those individuals con uh, contribute collectively to the structure of the business that okay. will help it to grow. Now, let's talk about um, do you hi for when you're starting a company, you obviously need some relevant skills. Mm -hmm. in, even in a startup, do you want to hire for attitude or um, you know, their, their passion? Is that more important than hiring because you've known them in the past? Mm -hmm. Because I see a lot of people saying, well, I worked with them before for the last 35 years. Is that good or bad? So mm -hmm. they're really kind of mm -hmm. dual, dual questions in there. So let's yeah. take the first one. Mm -hmm. uh, do you hire for attitudes or do you hire for the skill? Which is more important? I think in the beginning you are definitely hiring for an operational skill and talent. You Interesting. Need, you need that. You okay. need it because you have a product that has to be developed or a service that has to be developed. You need competency. However, this is why it is so interesting. It, that alone is not enough. You also need cooperation. You need uh, chemistry and right. fit. And you need the alignment of the individual with the overall vision of the business. Yeah, so executive alignment is really critical and getting it diffused down. Do you help companies do that? Do you, do you coach the executives? Do you coach the teams? 
Um, how do you get that done? Do you, what kind of tools do you use? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you make it better? I mean, the goal is how do you make sure the company doesn't fail? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a big thing, of course. Uh, but it starts with the individual. It starts with also understanding what is the ultimate goal and objective of the business, other than thriving, which is what we, we ultimately want, Correct. of course. But we look at each individual and how aligned they are with that bigger vision. And it is coaching that person according to not necessarily their skill set, David, but it's the other behaviors and attributes that they bring or don't bring to the team. Okay, so let's look at a startup. You have a technical founder. Mm -hmm. Okay, a lot of the technical, a lot of the startups are techies. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they have this great skill. They can develop software, but they don't have the the softer skills or the operational skills. Mm -hmm. How does that person find the right people to complement him or her? Mm -hmm. the, the challenge that entrepreneurs or business leaders have is they, they oftentimes hire quickly because they are under tremendous pressure to bring in the talent. Correct. Right? And so they're under that pressure, they're impatient to bring in the talent, and then once the talent is in there, they realize, boy, this person is, they are technically competent, but they don't, they don't work well with other people. Then, if you are the founder or entrepreneur, it is hard for you then to fire quickly, especially if it's someone you brought in on the ground floor, because there's a sense or feeling of indebtedness to them. You know, no, but they, they also have their, their executive agreements, most likely, so they have, you know, if they get fired, you know, or they get excused mm -hmm. um, and they get outplaced, mm -hmm. you know, let's put mm -hmm. a little plug in here, mm -hmm. um, they have that opportunity to at least walk away with some semblance of respect and some money as well. So, uh, but firing quickly is really critical, isn't it? It is. But David, I think a lot of startups and, and uh, emerging companies aren't that organized. There are so many people that we work with that never had any sort of formal agreements. There's, there is an element of having that HR input and even a legal input that oftentimes is missing. Yeah, so w one, of the thing, one of the other guests I had at, a, at, a, at another time uh, was a lawyer and getting a good lawyer to make sure you have those, you know, agreements, the employee agreements, executive agreements becomes real critical. Mm -hmm. You know, I get that. Now, what happens as the company matures and the company is now growing? Mm -hmm. You know, what, how do the skills shift from the startup mode into now I'm in operational mode? What, mm -hmm. what needs to change? What needs to change typically is that people go from uh, the operational aspect to cooperating and managing mm -hmm. and additionally you are moving and pushing those strategies to the completion line as well right. but it becomes more complicated because there are there are more moving parts can, can you give an example where uh, you've coached a team and it has gone from bad to good that you know where you know the, the, the company said well it was on the rocky edge mm -hmm. what did they do to change it and, you, and if you want, you can combine a variety of the companies that you've worked with. Mm -hmm. But what has changed? How were you able to affect change? Did you use a diagnostic tool? Was it, um, you know, a heart-to-heart? -heart? Was it a, you know, sort of a come-to-Jesus session, so mm -hmm. to speak? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The foundation of our coaching always begins with a diagnostic tool, as you call it. We use a behavioral assessment called the Harrison Assessment. Okay. And it identifies 175 traits about one individual. And we combine those traits collectively to see what is the profile of the, the executive team in general. Is that something like the DISC or the, something like the Myers-Briggs? Or is it, obviously it's more detailed. Yes. It, it's a behavioral assessment, and they're all different in their own way. But, but I think what, what happens when we see success in a team working, to better, working better, uh, more productively and more effectively, it, it generally using an age-old um, adage, it starts at the top. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree with it's So our focus, first and foremost, is looking at the top layer. So how do you know that the team is effective? Is there a, is there a telltale? I have an idea how mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. determine, based upon my experience, mm -hmm. how a team is effective. Mm -hmm. But how do you determine if it's effective, the team? Well, there's a lot of different things that you can look at. It's sort of like the KPIs, right? Okay. Um, are they meeting their deadlines? That's the first indicator. Are they effective? If they're not meeting their deadlines, something's amiss. 
Okay, so it's it's really so you you focused on productivity, mm -hmm. and it's interesting. I was thinking about if a team can laugh and you know enjoy themselves mm -hmm. and go out after work, even being in the trenches. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the you know the start of a really effective team. But clearly, they can't just have it as a social organization. You know, they have to have it as something that results in growth, bottom line, margin improvement, whatever. Yes, uh, business is business is really about people, but business is about results. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. So I'm going to give you the uh, the last word, eh, kind sure. of the, sort of the last word. Mm -hmm. uh, but what would be the three takeaways you want our viewing audience to think about as they think about building an executive team? Three things. I'm going to start one first and foremost. I think when looking at bringing in the talent and the team that you want, business leaders have to ask themselves, maybe even numerous times during the day, what's the highest and best use of my time? Got it. And so we build a team to fill in and bolster those areas that we may not be the strongest in or that we don't care to be involved okay. in. Uh, second of all, I think hiring for diversity is really important. Agreed. And I'm not talking about physical diversity. I'm talking about diversity of thought. Yeah, totally, totally buy into that one. Yes. And, and thirdly, chemistry. Do, do the, the diversity of thought and the, the talents and, and the, of the people that you're bringing in, will they fit together well, well and will they, will they work together to advance the growth of the business? Okay. Um, I'd like you to be back on the show because I have so many more questions. And as this company grows, we can almost see it progress from small company startup mm -hmm. into global unicorn. So if you would be willing to come back, that I'd would be great. I'd love to. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. <laughs> This is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. Hope you enjoyed the show. Good afternoon. This is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. And I want to welcome Mark Skeist from Stradling Yucca, a law firm that uh, I've used before, and we've had meetings from Tech Coast Angels. Welcome, Mark. Thank, thank you. you, David. Great to be here. And thank you for being my guest. You know, one of the areas that I'm really interested in in business is the issue of risk. Uh, a lot of companies, be they startups or be they uh, ongoing businesses, don't really consider risk. So I want to get your perspective on not only business risk, because you're a businessman as well as an attorney, and particularly some of the legal risks which can cause bumps in the night and affect your bottom line. So before we even start on that, why don't you give the viewers a uh, quick background of your capabilities and what you've been doing. Happy to. Thanks, David. I am a corporate transactional attorney. I represent primarily companies, some investors, private equity firms, uh, but primarily in transactions. So I help companies uh, all the way from formation to the various rounds of financing, all the way to the ultimate exit, whether that be a merger, acquisition, a transaction, or a public offering. So I want to come back to the exit part because every, especially investors like us angels, we want that exit. But what kind of problems or what kind of things have you seen that have gone bump in the night, um, you know, in some of the companies over the last year or two that you've dealt with? Well, common problems arise typically, they can arise any time in a company's life cycle, but they typically arise because there was not proper planning or thinking about the issues as the company was formed or in the early stages. So either from choosing the wrong entity so it's not uh, tax efficient, uh, ultimately for an exit, to not adequately protecting the intellectual property, to uh, having issues in terms of how you've raised the money and violating securities laws. So all of the, all of the things that ultimately come out of the woodwork when somebody's doing due diligence, whether it be an investor or a potential acquirer, and, and sometimes it can kill a deal and uh, consequently kill a company. Yeah, I remember the issues. If you get somebody who is trying to raise funds and they're not a broker-dealer, you have to be real careful because the investors have that opportunity to back out, and that quashes the deal and probably uh, submarines the whole company. But let's talk about capitalization. Let's talk about the startup. When a company starts, what would you recommend one of the first steps they do? Other than get a good attorney, I mean. Well, right, you've got to choose what type of entity they want to be. And I think for the, mo for the most part, the types of companies that Tech Coast Angels or venture capital firms would look at would be a C corporation, so properly forming as a, as a C corp. But 
you know, it doesn't hurt to, to talk to an attorney to see if maybe a limited liability or a pass-through entity or a different structure might make sense. So I think first and foremost is choosing the right, the right entity. And when you choose the right entity, are there some kind of checkpoints that you would say if you're doing this, if you're in software, you want to be a C-Corp, if you're in um, maybe food services or something else, you want to be an LLC, and what about conversions to like starting with an S-Corp because you can save some money and get some good pass-through advantages? Uh, then going to a C-Corp and getting double taxation. Yeah, all of that works. Uh, oftentimes we'll see companies start as an LLC, and primarily because they don't know if ultimately they're going to go and attract money from institutional investors. The venture capital firms, the angel firms, they typically tend to prefer to invest in, in a C-Corp. Um, right, right. But, but as we know, much more tax efficient to be an LLC, including all the way to the exit. If you can hold on as a, as a pass-through entity, you'll be happier when you ultimately sell the company from a tax standpoint. But that said, the investors want the C-Corp. So, uh, but, but sometimes you don't know if you're going to go to an institutional investor. So I would say if you're the type of business that knows we're going straight to the venture capital world as soon as we can, uh, we'll, we'll typically steer them towards a C-Corp. But if, you know, they may just generate enough income to get it going uh, without having to go to outside investors, limited liability company probably makes a lot of sense. Okay. Now, we've talked about the theory, you know, about doing this. Can you give a real live example without, you know, disclosing, you know, you can change the name to protect the innocent. Uh, but can you give a real life example where something did not go well and can you talk about some of the consequences that arose? In terms of the... In the, terms the, of the, the capitalization one we just talked about. Sure, I, I've got one right now and he's, uh, he's got some investors that are willing to write a check but he formed as a limited liability company but he elected to be taxed as an S-Corp. And uh, if you don't know, S-Corps are very restrictive in terms of, uh, you know, the types of investors you can have, only right. individuals, you can only have one class of stock. So, I mean, that's not, it's not necessarily a nightmare scenario, but we're having to do a lot of undoing to, to change the entity back to, a, to an LLC that's, that's taxed as a partnership, which is probably the right way to do it uh, from the get-go. Wow. Well, yeah, so that could create a real big problem uh, if you're trying to raise funds in the future. So if, if, a, if, the, if the entrepreneur or the startup um, the CEO had a vision that he wanted to be larger down the line, he wanted to raise additional rounds of capital, I can't see any logical reason to start as an LLC. Would there be? Or, or would, there be a, it, would it be just cost effective to start here for, because of the tax laws? I don't well, know. You, ra you raised a good point earlier, which is the LLC, you get the pass through on the losses. So if you have other, other forms of income that you want to use the losses, in the startup to, to offset against, then an LLC might make good sense. And, and I have plenty of clients that are LLCs. They're raising money. They've gone through Series A, Series B, Series C financings. They're just not raising the money from the institutional venture firms, which in short cannot invest in LLCs or don't because of tax consequences that, that arise to them as, as tax free entities. All right. So now we talked about tax consequences. What are some of the tax issues that might come up? I mean, we've heard before and I mean before, before, so, you know, in, in our, you know, collective past, that if you don't do the tax, if you don't set up the rules correctly for options, for compensation, there could be liabilities on both sides, and that can create a real drain on your profitability. Drain on profitability and impede or impair your ability to raise money or to sell. I think the, the areas that we see the most issues with, if, if we see any, are setting up as an S-Corp and operating as an S-Corp for a number of years, but not complying with the S-Corp rules. And so you're, you're an invalid S-Corp. And, and when the buyer or the investor does due diligence and realizes that, uh, they run for the hills. Secondly, when you're granting stock options and you're not complying with the rules that require that you value the options at fair market value, right. and you're not going and getting formal valuations, and the board is just picking a number out of thin air, buyers and investors W will diligence that, and if you and if if you haven't complied with the tax laws, the, the provision is 409A. Uh, again, you've got adverse tax consequences to the option E, horrific tax consequences potentially to the company, and again, you're gonna you're gonna kill a, a potential sale transaction or a financing if you haven't thought about right. that stuff early on. Yeah. So the one thing that I remember, I was watching the Social Network, and you know, I was watching the the actors portray Zuckerberg and one of his you know colleagues, and there was a rift. How do you prevent the rifts like that from happening, or do you plan that there may be that eventuality? And what you put, and how do you put in place certain things that protect both the uh, 
uh, the company as well as protect the individuals that are on the executive team? I think it's an, it, it, particularly going back to that initial meeting when you're talking to the founders, and it, it's almost I'm um, acting as as a divorce attorney in some respects because you're asking these these people coming together and starting a business to to think about all the eventualities and the her, the parade of horribles that could happen, even though they never think they will happen at, in the early stages. And so, yeah, you you want to have well drafted shareholder agreements and buy sell agreements, because I don't want to see invariably, but but it it, it happens way more often than you think that founders go sideways on one another or somebody's no yep. longer interested or in, in invested in the business and the other owner who's who's putting their heart and soul into it calls and asks me how do we get rid of the founder who's not performing and unless you've got those things baked into some sort of agreement from the get-go it, it's very difficult to yeah and that would be the operational agreement that codifies the responsibilities of all the executives the parties the members if you're an LLC or you know the executives right that's right and also ties and conditions their retention of the equity in right. the corporation to their ongoing and continued involvement so we're, we're basically out of time but I wanted to let you have the last word so to speak, yeah, not necessarily, I, I, but, but, but I, wanted you to, I wanted you to share the top three things that the viewers should take away from this discussion. Okay, not a shameless plug, but do consult with an attorney early on, and, and I know there are ways to save money by doing it yourself, but again, a, a good attorney who's uh, experienced in working with startups and emerging companies will help you navigate through a lot of these issues to, to avoid, because as you said, you want to mitigate risk. Uh, so I think that, that that's the top takeaway is to is to sit down with somebody that can counsel you to avoid these mistakes that will cost you not only a lot of money, not only uh, impact and, and impede your ability to grow, but potentially could kill your business. Well, it takes time away from putting your energies on to the right thing. And most attorneys, I think you, uh, um, Stradling, also uh, offer special rates for some of the startups. Yeah, like the Silicon Valley model, we'll, we're very flexible because what, what every startup needs, regardless of the type of business or the industry, is fairly generic. And so we're able to, to do that cost effectively and, right. and get them to the point where they can start to raise some and money. As you grow, and as they grow from a little acorn into this massive company that's now a unicorn, you will hopefully be able to grow with them and provide them good legal That's advice. the goal. Yep. Yeah, and I think that's a great goal. Mark, I appreciate you being on our show. Uh, thank you very much. This is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business.